Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm Teresa. And we are the co-authors of the book, Pass the Baton, Empowering All Music Students. Our goal is to share stories of educators who are passing the baton and empowering their music students. We want to help teachers create music lessons that transform students from passive consumers to vibrant creatives. Okay, so we're here today with Holly Gage. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing a presentation that Holly did for the South Dakota Bandmasters Association Conference um, a few weeks ago. And it was just really neat to hear about how she's creating a student-centered band room. So we're really happy to have her here today. Thank you for having me. Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and uh, tell us about your current teaching position? Okay, um, I am a South Dakota girl through and through. I grew up in South Dakota and went to a small school and um, graduated from Augustana College in Sioux Falls. Um, I know there's another one in, in um, Illinois, but yeah. That's right. Yep. <laughs> <Or at least. laughs> the other one. <laughs> yes. Um, and I loved my experience there. And this is my 14th year of teaching. So um, I've done all grade levels, all types of um, different teaching situations. So I've done four years of high school. I've done five years of uh, middle school teaching between South Dakota and a little bit in Iowa. And, and I've done five years in general music and third through fifth grade band in Washington, DC. So um, Washington, DC is really where I like was able to reflect on who I am as a teacher and what I actually wanted to, to like focus on. Um, because while I was here, I just have always just taught the way that I was taught. And um, like you say in your book, like uh, the students were like successful, but they were never um, really, they like engaged, but they were never really empowered to, to do more. So I was actually, it was an interesting situation in DC where it was third through fifth grade beginning band. And it was so challenging, but I figured it out because it was, third through fifth graders beginning on an instrument and they were in my classroom for one hour a week in large groups of mixed instrumentation. So I really had to think outside the box on how I was going to like help them learn and be successful. So uh, that's where I learned that I didn't have to teach the way I was always taught. So <laughs> um, we, we did move back though to South Dakota during the pandemic just to be closer to family and, um, yeah, we have a son now, so it's nice to um, have family around us. <laughs> um, and I'm actually teaching now in the same school district that I was before I left, um, just at a different middle school. So I teach, um, currently, I have two elementary schools where I teach fifth grade beginning band, um, and they get banned two days a week, and uh, they feed the middle school that I teach at in the afternoons. So it's nice to teach your feeder schools. <laughs> yes. Yes, I've always loved doing that. You you feel like you have a certain, you only have it yourself to blame if anything is, right. <laughs> but then you also can can look ahead for yourself. That's great. Yeah. So in your presentation, you talked about how you were using checklists with your students. Um, can you tell us more about that and how does that give your kids ownership in the band room? Yeah, um, I'm going to talk about three different types of checklists that I use because it's not just... Um, one population of students that can can be empowered by um, by a checklist. So um, uh, my goal is to really cl close that gap between um, the low achieving and the high achieving students. So um, in some classrooms where you have like a mature group um, and high achieving students, I like to use a checklist for students to do um, student led sectionals and having a section leader is great, but it's also nice to empower the, the section as a whole to work as a team and work together. So that's teaching them a lot of different skills. So, um, and with that checklist, it's super clear, like during this sectional, I want you to, or students will be able to play this section of the song. So having a clear goal and objective that's attainable, um, not just play this song, and call it good. Um, just, and how, how are they going to achieve that goal too? So um, are we going to tune certain notes? Are we going to 
figure out the rhythms or notice the key signatures, just things that they need to focus in on. Um, and at the end, making sure that everybody in the group has a voice, um, just asking the question like, do we all feel that we've improved? What do we need to still work on? What do we need to ask Ms. Gage about? Um, just letting them also follow up and making sure that they're working together as a team to help each other. So that's, that's one that I use for my more mature groups that are able to work together out, without me being in front of them all the time. So that's great. And these are middle school kids, right? Yeah. I, um, I used, I did this a lot with high schoolers mm -hmm. and, um, our eighth grade groups can handle this too. That's so, really good to hear. Yeah. With it, it's really important to be consistent. So you, you have to teach them how to work together and you have to like, be consistent with doing it, just doing it once and just being done with it, it might fall on its face. So um, just giving them the opportunity to keep doing it and trusting them to do it is important. Yeah. That trust piece is huge. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what are, what are some of the others? Okay. The next one I like to do with beginners is I, um, we have to teach our beginners how to practice. So um, we can't just tell them to go home and practice. They, don't know how to do that. Um, so every year at the beginning of the year, I have a little slip. It says purposeful practice on it. And it's the steps in how to practice. And I tape that to the inside flap of their folder. So they go through those steps and we practice those steps in class too. So it's like step one is clapping and counting rhythms. So they're getting the rhythms. Step two is air playing. So they're saying the note names while they're doing the fingerings or slide positions. And then step three is to play it. And um, after they've played it, they identify any hot spots. So what was hard, and then we chunk it. I call it chunking. <laughs> so we play that section like three times, four times until we can't do it wrong anymore. And then we go back and play it all again. So just having those steps written out for them and we practice it in class, they're able to go home and also practice it that way. So. Teaching them how to practice is helping them become independent. So at the end of the day, we don't want them to need us anymore. <laughs> so we have to teach them how to do that. Very much so. I feel like sometimes kids go home and it's like practice just means start at the beginning and stop at the end. And right, yeah, you definitely have to teach that all of those steps or they don't, they don't inherently know those things. That's awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we want them to do more than just what's inside our classroom. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And part of that is like just practicing, practicing <laughs> and just going through those steps. Like if they don't know how to count rhythms, then they're not going to be able to go home and do it. Right. If they don't know note names, they're not going to be able to go home and do it. Do they ever um, like do they ever write reflections about how things are going or like, I guess, do you, I'm guessing when you have small groups, there's time when you're conferring with kids about like how it's going and then you kind of get an idea of who's missing a step or how does that work? Yeah, they have section, um, small section uh, lessons. So where it's the most that there is in a section is four students. Mm -hmm. So a lesson. So I'm able to kind of pick out that just by listening. So I don't have them right, although that is a really good idea. <laughs> well, um, but I mean, if you're conferring with them, like you're getting the same information. So, yeah. 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 So, yeah just by listening to them, I know where I kind of know where they're struggling at. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and then that's, I have the third type of list is for students that have um, IEPs or 504 plans that need different accommodations in classrooms. And um, I don't always limit it to students that need, like have documented um, accommodations because anybody can feel like a small fish in a big pond in a big classroom yeah. um, where there's a lot of noise and stuff going on. So for students that need accommodations, like I always make sure that I'm checking with the SPED teachers at the beginning of the year because they know those needs a lot more than I do. And um, just making sure I, I know what those needs are and I'm meeting them, whether it's, I mean, this is kind of a sidetrack, but making sure that like they're being seated in the right spot or if they have dyslexia, I'm making sure that I have 
just one song copied on a page, those types of things. But what I've noticed is that most accommodations for students are ones that have trouble following step-by-step -step directions mm -hmm. or following the routine when they walk into a classroom. So even though it's a routine that everybody else can handle, it's, it's something that they need help with along the way. So I'll write out, and it's different for a lot of students too. So it's not just a one size fits all, but um, printing off a, say, a little checklist that they can have on their folder or in their music or in their like instrument cubby that helps them know like step one is to put my folder on my music stand. Step two is to take out my instrument. Step three, put my music in order. Just those, those steps that aren't so simple. Um, just helping them decode all of that is really helpful because then they're not stressed out about figuring out what everybody else is doing and they can focus more on like actually playing their instrument. So, yeah, to me, I already, I immediately thought of like, there's comfort in like in the routine and it's very, mm -hmm. you know, that's lined out for me. So I don't have to freak out when I walk in this room. That's sometimes loud and chaotic because everybody's doing all these things. So that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I just thought about this sometimes for concerts too, that's an even more overwhelming situation where it mm -hmm. isn't always routine. So for concerts, I'll print out the um, print out the the program extra for them, and then I can write on the program like where they go on stage, how they're going to get there, what they do when they're done. Just those little steps just takes a lot of anxiety away for some kids. Mm -hmm. So well, even if it's just like the first fifth grade concert that they have, I'll make sure that they all have a little thing of the program order, <laughs> and that takes takes the pressure off of you knowing that you don't have to walk that student through every step, but it also, the student knows they don't have to rely on you for that, that they can do it themselves. And I yeah. think that's, that's yeah. such a big thing. Yeah. I make sure that they have a buddy along the way too, mm -hmm. that they're sitting next to someone that's also reliable and that can help them. That's really yeah, it's like you said, it's like the, the idea of they're feeling independent, you know, you've given them just enough that they, they, you know, they have that feeling and that confidence of, I, I, I got this, I can do this, uh -huh. which is awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So um, also with those checklists uh, for accommodations, if it's a student that has a struggle of reading or speaks a different language, like to put that in pictures or to put that in a, a language that makes sense to them is also really helpful. That makes sense. I was just going to ask you that. Yeah, I think uh, pictures could be really helpful for some for some students. That's awesome. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just I'm picturing all of the places that this could be useful besides just a van room. You yeah. Know? I mean, that's mm -hmm. it. It seems it seems like common sense. Yet I don't know that we do it as much as we should. Yeah, and I originally got the idea because I had students that really needed help along the way. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, I had five in one, five students in one classroom that were just like all over the place. And I went to this bed teacher and she's like, here, let's try this. And I was blown away by how much it helped and it helped the students. And yeah. yeah. So that, that made me just think like even a social story might help certain kids, you know, knowing the routine. Um, it's just another way to, to, to help kids know what's going to come. Maybe a social story for like a, an evening event when you know it's going to be slightly different and mm -hmm. there's not a lot of practice in that new place. That could be really cool too. Yeah. So, yeah. So what advice would you give someone if, if they were going to start and try to make some checklists or, you know, and implement them? What would you, what's your advice? Um, take the time to do it. It takes time in the front end and have a good relationship with your, your SPED teams. <laughs> but and with any of these lists, it takes time to like make a list for each group that's going into a sectional um, or each student that needs help. But at the end of the day, it's really saving you a lot of time mm -hmm. because and making your classroom a lot more efficient too. So you can get a lot more done in the day if they um, are becoming a lot more self-sufficient by themselves. So that's the biggest one. <laughs> um, and assume nothing. So <laughs> even though you think they know, 
just when you're making the list, like bullet points, not long sentences, just at least amount of words and be as clear as possible. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. All right. So the last, you know, 12, 14 months have been a bit unusual for a lot of us in the teaching profession. Is there anything that you've learned or you've tried different this year that you are going to continue maybe when we're back to normal? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, our school has been open um, full-time all year, but there's been times when we've had like 50% of our classes here. Um, so I have, we've done a lot of different things um, just to keep school open um, and to help the kids that aren't in school. Um, so there's a lot of things that I would actually keep. In the middle school, we use uh, Schoology mm -hmm. and we post our daily agenda on the board through Google Slides. So we link that. So if they're gone, they're not missing any announcements, but we're also one-to-one -one school. So we PDF all of our music and put it on Schoology. So if they're at home and don't have their music, they have access to it. Or if they're in school and forgot their music at home, they still have access to it. So that's definitely something we'll keep doing. Um, in elementary, we use Seesaw. And at the end of last year in April, um, I started making YouTube videos of myself playing um, all the songs in their book. So like I'll play a song in the book two times on two different instruments at two different speeds. And then I'm still, and then I posted them in Seesaw for the students to be able to just practice at home. But this year I'm doing it as like their weekly practice at home and they can record themselves back. And I give them feedback in the middle of the week. So they don't just see me twice a week they also get feedback in the middle of the week too. Yeah. So I'll keep doing that because we can play the song during class, but they go home and maybe forget it too. So, um, and the third thing, Oh yeah. The, um, virtual concerts, like, I think we're all kind of over it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever want to have just a virtual concert again, yeah. but the ability to post videos of students playing like during class is really powerful because they're the parents are also seeing their kids what they're doing in school right. and they're like part of the they're seeing the learning process and not just the final concert yeah so it's been really fun to just post like those little eight measure songs from method books and have the parents be like oh that's really great thank you and yeah we've had good reception for just little little pieces instead of a whole virtual concert. So, yeah. Well, and it's nice that you are focusing on the process because you're going to be working on that little eight measure piece, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So you right. can just share that and share that, you know, we have to do this in order to get to that concert band piece or whatever it is that you're performing. Yeah. Yeah. That's really yeah, and for fifth graders here in a normal year, we would have a fifth grade festival where all of the feeder elementaries would get together yeah. and it's really great. And it's a great recruitment retention activity, but it's honestly been kind of nice to not have to worry about doing that this year because we've been able to focus more on the fundamentals yes. and making sure that they know all the note names and stuff rather than giving a fifth grader a concert song in right. January. <laughs> and then just knowing that you have to learn that song. Yeah. Yeah. It's been nice um, to be able to focus on the little things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's so it's nice to make your room transparent. I feel like, you know, it's like the iceberg. Parents see that top part, mm -hmm. but yeah. they really love seeing like, oh, you're practicing rhythms. Oh, you're learning a new note. Oh, you're learning a technique. I mean, all those things are things that they may not think of, you know. Right. And it's kind of cool to, for them to see that what happens every day. That's very mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. So Thanks so much, Holly, for sharing with us. Um, if someone wanted to connect with you on social media or how, how would how would someone connect with you? Yeah, on Facebook, it's Holly Jean, J-E-A-N. And um, my school email is holly.gage at k12.sd.us. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for spending the time and telling us all about your checklists and just sharing with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank yes. you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. Make sure you subscribe below. And follow us on social media. I'm at Musical Teresa. I'm Singing Finch One. And you can follow the hashtag Pass the Baton Book.